and chat for uh, for the next hour. Uh, no, I hope I can promise you that we are going to have a, uh, a stimulating conversation that we very much want you guys to be uh, a part of as well. So um, we'll uh, we'll we'll start with a bit of a provocation, and then hopefully you guys will have some uh, some questions um, as well for the uh, for the panel. So welcome to Blackfriars House, our beautiful Blackfriars, um, and this is our third and final instalment of the uh, Blue Dot in Conversation events that we've been doing. Um, and it's part of Bruntwood's uh, partnership with the Blue Dot Festival, which for anybody that doesn't know, is happening between the 21st and the 24th of July at Jodrell Bank. Um, Blue Dot combines art, music and science in a blend of culture and innovation. Um, and this really mirrors Bruntwood's approach to placemaking as well. And that for us is why we've got this natural um, natural partnership and relationship. Um, and for us at Bruntwood, our purpose is to create thriving cities. Um, and we believe this partnership is a really important part of that. Um, places for us that prioritise well-being, inclusivity, sustainability and importantly for today's conversation, are culturally vibrant as well. The first two events in the series, um, the first one was um, a, um, a conversation with Tom Heap in uh, April, talking about his book, 39 Ways to Save the Planet. So I can guess what that one was about. Um, and then the second one, again, probably needs a little introduction. It was with, um, with Helen Pankhurst, um, so talking about women's rights and uh, the persistent inequalities in our society. So that and today's conversation will be available on um, on podcasts. So if you weren't available to make, make those, then hopefully you'll be able to uh, to catch up on them. Um, but today we're going to be talking about culture and um, in particular what it means for uh, Manchester, which is where we, uh, where we are sitting, um, and what it means for the communities of Manchester as well. Um, I, I don't think it needs much of a uh, much of an introduction. I think everybody is very well aware that Manchester has a very rich cultural heritage, um, much uh, talked about, uh, not just within the city but uh, but across the world as well. Um, lots of famous um, Mancunians with um, with cultural uh, cultural heritage. So today, really, it's just to talk about the role of culture in uh, Manchester and the and actually the role of Manchester uh, in culture as well what res what role and responsibility do we all have um, to play um, within the uh, within the cultural sector um, we're going to touch on, um, on on the engagement with culture and particularly like to focus on um, diversity but diversity and most importantly inclusivity as well um, we can have uh, we, we can have all sorts of uh, diverse activities but actually do, do people feel that they are for them um, and do people feel like they are yeah, that they belong as well so um, as I say, we'll uh, we'll get into these conversations, and uh, so please do think of uh, think of any inspiring questions that uh, that you guys have as we're going through. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, I'm Kate Vokes. I wear various different hats in the world and relevant for today, I suppose. I'm a non-exec director at Bruntwood. We've got lots of relationships with cultural organisations across all of the cities and places that we work. Um, I'm also the chair of the Oglesby Charitable Trust, who also has lots of uh, cultural um, partnerships alongside um, our other charitable relationships. Um, and I also sit on the board of the Royal Exchange uh, Theatre um, which is uh, which is where partly where my relationship with um, with, with Inga um, sits. Um, so we have Gavin from the Band on the Wall, the fabulous uh, institution. That uh, how many people in the room have been to uh, been to Band on the Wall? <laughs> I hadn't realised I was going to ask that question, but uh, I'm glad. To, yeah, glad I did. How many people are planning to go to Band on the Wall? <laughs> Well, I would positively encourage it because they've just spent a huge amount of money and it's been closed for uh, for two years while they've uh, while they've done it and uh, it's absolutely uh, absolutely joyful space. But the big the best kept secret, which uh, lots of people don't know, is that uh, they do a huge amount of charitable work as well, which we'll come on to um, talk about. Um, and the gigs and events actually fund um, the learning and, uh, and charitable and community um, engagement work. Um, we have Inga, Director of Relationships and Engagement at the Royal Exchange, and uh, Inga's also a trustee at um, Thick Skin Physical Theatre Company as well, so hopefully we'll talk a little bit about, about that um, relationship as well. Um, Inga and I have worked together both uh, in my capacity as being on the board of the Royal Exchange, but also Bruntwood has a playwriting competition that they run in partnership with the Exchange, um, and we've also got a community project that we support through the Oglesby Charitable Trust called Local Exchange 
um, that has the wonderful pop-up theatre, The Den, which is coming to um, Cheatham Hill this year, and coincidentally and brilliantly, the Ukrainian Centre. Um, and again, hopefully, we'll talk uh, we'll talk a little bit more about um, a bit more about that. And my new uh, my new best friend. We only we only met uh, we only met last week, um, but um, I'm always really really keen. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about young people and talking about what young people should have and what we should do for young people. Um, and every time I've got an opportunity now to uh, to do something like this, I'm trying to encourage actually getting uh, young voices um, on the panel. So um, Bosha and I met at a Young Manchester event last week, but brilliantly um, spoke spoke this keeps cutting in and out, but it's important for the recording. Um, but but brilliantly, um, your first uh, piece of spoken words on stage was actually at um, Home Ground in the summer, which was um, on the Bruntwood stage. So it was just entirely serendipitous that we uh, that we met and, uh, and 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 said I'd love to uh, love to get you involved in uh, in today. Um, so that's enough for me. You guys can uh, you guys can do all the uh, all all the talking now. I think just to get started, I'm really always really interested with people who are working in the um, in in arts and um, culture. Um, what you know, what when was it? If it, if there was a moment that you got inspired um, by something or some body or some uh, occasion in um, in in the arts world, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Um, was there was there a defining moment, Gavin, that you suddenly went right? That's it. I'm. Uh... Sorry. I was just looking at them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> <laughs> we should do some audio description, really, shouldn't we? we should, yeah. There was nine people walked into the room. <laughs> right. So uh, the microphone's gone off. So I'll just try and project. Um, yes. So for me, uh, Kate, I was the product of a inspirational teacher. So I went to a normal uh, secondary modern school on um, a council estate on the edge of Blackpool and um, not masses going for it, except um, almost like the movie, it was the teacher who created the huge concert extravaganzas at the end of the summer and every Christmas. And uh, I just was captivated by it, really. Uh, and got drawn into it. So um, started, first of all, by um, performing, acting in those uh, productions, and then uh, rapidly uh, joined the band, started playing saxophone. And then that was it. I went to music college. I studied saxophone. Uh, I joined a reggae band, and we toured the world. And that was pretty much my 20s, right there. There you go. And it's a big decision, I think, from move from your passion to then working in it as well. Is that... Yeah, I would say for uh, certainly my background is that with, my family's background was all construction industry and manual labor. So, you know, uh, no, no one uh, from my family had ever done anything like it at all. So, uh, yeah, I, but I got loads of support. I can't, you know, I, I, my, my parents and um, were hugely supportive. Um, they, they also loved music and my grandparents really loved music and, and, you know, we kind of, um, my granddad loved jazz and, and songs from the musicals. And so I was kind of immersed in that stuff, you know, as a kid. And it, I think it, it, it does, it does get ingrained in you. And, um, I'm a real advocate for really just exposing as many kids as possible to music, to the, to the, uh, and arts and culture and acting and drama and singing. Um, as is, and painting. All my daughters uh, paint uh, all the time. My wife's uh, an artist. Uh, and we just think it's an incredibly en enriching um, thing for young people to do, whether they go into it professionally or, or not. You know, it's just, it's just a, 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 a thing that, that enriches life. So uh, lots of my family is still kind of in the construction industry, and I regularly say to them uh, what we should be doing is building a piano into every new house that's ever built in the country, uh, never mind. Obviously, insulation is important, but, you know, a piano, <laughs> come on. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm, I'm from. I'm a real advocate for, for just giving young people the opportunity to make music, and it doesn't really need to be formal classes. It just needs to be immersion in music and, and opening the door to, to opportunity to be able to make music. And, and that, if we come on to the, those in the discussions, that, that really underpins an awful lot of what we, we are aiming to achieve at Ban on the Wall, certainly in our new spaces. Should I 
Inga? Inga? Yeah, I guess very similar experiences in terms of how I got involved and uh, from Huddersfield and went to the local high school and that first time of when I was in year six doing like a transition uh, from junior school to high school and, and as part of that they took us to see the dress rehearsal of Bugsy Malone and I just sat there and was like I cannot wait to get to high school I want to be in that that looks amazing um, and uh, and that uh, but the school didn't have really much money and it, they didn't do a show every year. They couldn't afford to do that. Um, but any opportunity that was, whether it was that stage managing a little play or putting on a play in the church or anything that was kind of around that I could do, um, uh, you know, I was there for it. And um, and again, that inspirational drama teacher that um, supported that and gave those opportunities um, in his own time and made those things happen um, was so inspiring. And, and he kind of, you know, help me to to find opportunities outside of school because there wasn't many in school. So he would link me into other things in the community, uh, so that I could get those opportunities in so the school couldn't provide it. And um, I think there was also a few moments where, like, the National Theatre brought um, a touring production of Oh What a Lovely War in a big top tent, and it was on in Wakefield. Um, and then the Lawrence Batley Theatre just opened in Huddersfield, a new theatre, um, and it had um, a production by Complicity. Um, and it was this really... that Those shows, two shows particularly, just blew my mind about what theatre could also do and it could it wasn't just about having a good time with my friends and and, and being on stage it was about the make me you know I cried in those plays I felt something I learned something about myself and the world in which I live and it just that was the inspiration of God this is this is what I want to do now I want to tell those stories I want to help more people and I think that thing that was in my hometown or it was in Wakefield and that work and my doorstep I didn't have to come over to Manchester to see it or go down to London to see it um, and it was there for me to access. And I think that's always been the driving force for me then um, and how I ended up working in engagement. So all my work has always been in engagement work. Um, I, I started off working in places it, when I went to, I moved to London, I was working in Slough and Hackney and Tower Hamlets. And it's all been about engaging people, whether it's children, adults who learn disabilities um, in theatre and the arts and people being able to tell their own stories um, and that's been my driving force um, uh, throughout all my work but yeah again that that important teacher that important person who opens that door to you when again no one from my family has ever worked in theatre before no one had you know w was following this as a career but it's that um, you know p that one person who can who says yeah this is for you and you can do it and uh, they're so they're so important hopefully I do that now for other people through my job and we're just talking because member of the young company at the Royal Exchange before and those things are so important then to see people uh, you know finding those opportunities sorry what was the question again <laughs> <laughs> I, I've what? just been listening to them and I'm just like oh wow okay tell me <laughs> Then. Well, what inspired you, or what is inspiring you at the moment to do to do what you're doing? In uh... okay, um, it was about like getting exposed, right, to like creativity and all that. Um, my earliest memory would be f me being five and loving to dance at every single party, um, and having all my sisters' friends invite me when they're teenagers, and I'm like seven, eight, because I just loved performing. Um, but I think I think when I was 14, um, so we went back to Libya where I'm from uh, for this, not the summer, when we say summer, we end up going for like four months, by the way. Um, it's just a typical North African thing to do. Um, but yeah, we had a house in the capital and we're from the mountains. So we used to go every weekend to my granddad's house and, you know, you just get bored, or, or, you know, sitting down in a car for like two hours. So I got my mum's phone and I was, um, I was interviewing my siblings in three different languages and I was switching and apparently it sounded good. That's what my parents said. Uh, and then they turned around and they were like, Woof. You should be a TV presenter. You should have your own show. I was like, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. And then I forgot about it. And then two years later, um, and then two years later, I was like, oh yeah, this is what I wanna do. I wanna get into the media industry. I wanna get into the creative industry. Um, just because I feel like I've got, I just love people and I love learning about people and talking to people. And that's how I met mm -hmm. you because I approached her and I was like, yeah, you look good. <laughs> Flattery gets you everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But yeah, I love talking to people. I love learning about people. But also, one of the reasons that I started was, and I was telling this to my dad, and I remember where exactly and what shop we were at. And I was like, I want to start to show every single young girl. And by the way, I'm not here an advocate for women only. I'm an advocate for everyone. Uh, you know, I appreciate people that are like feminist, ladies that are feminists. They're like, oh, pro women. We want to give women jobs. Da, da, da. I support you and I appreciate you. But for me, I want to make sure that everyone reaches their potential before they leave Earth, basically. And I want everyone to feel satisfied and fulfilled with like what they're creating and what they're doing. So my goal was like, I was telling my dad, I was like, you know, my goal is to show every single young girl at that time that she is more than capable of being a presenter, of being an actor. Doctor, a lawyer, whatever. Because to be honest with you, like I'm Libyan, and mostly like Libyans are very academic. So you go through the traditional route of being, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, you know, an architect. But like being a creative is really hard, and that was my goal to really like inspire people. Not that I'm very inspirational, by the way, <laughs> but you know, to inspire people and show them that you know a big goal is achievable, and it's okay to be the black sheep of the family. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, always really interesting just to hear hear what it is that's in, you know inspired um, inspired people. I'm really interested. I mean, Man Manchester's got this rich history and legacy of um, of culture. What what do you think, or, or how do you describe the role of of culture within Manchester? So Manchester's obviously made up of all sorts of different things um, that uh, that that tell its story. What do you think the role of of culture is in that? <laughs> um, well, it, it covers, you know, the, there's a role that um, culture plays, you know, so historically, and where it's landed Manchester on the map, you know, Manchester is where it is because of our rich history of music um, and the organisations that are here. It's put as our, you know, we have a global reputation, Manchester International Festival, um, the, the organisations that are here, the artists that are here. Um, but I think it's also for me as well the importance of that local culture and the culture that makes up and makes people proud of where they live but also that they have a voice within the city um so you think about pride or you think about on a more local level the Cheatham Hill Cultural Festival or all the events that happen around they're a celebration of the people that live here and it's an opportunity to to celebrate and that's what makes Manchester what it is it's it's the people um and we're so proud of that um and it, it you know and I think that's the opportunity that culture give, gives is that is that voice and those opportunities to celebrate the people that make up Manchester um but it also does have that global reach as well that culture plays I think for the city yeah I, th I think um one of the things that, that, that again we're focusing on and, and uh, we've we've spent some time kind of developing is is the 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 impact of the the migrant heritage on the city that that actually you know Manchester more than anything is a city of migrants uh, you go back 250 years and it's it's a little village that, you know there's very few people live in Manchester whose uh, lineage goes right the way back and you know is purely Mancunian it, so even um, so many of us have got uh, Irish uh, heritage or r rural English heritage uh, and very rapidly because Manchester's place in the industrial revolutions started drawing people from all over the world as it traded with the world then people arrived here and and personally I think and that, of course, is an ongoing process. You know, it, it doesn't stop. Uh, and I personally think that, that that's one of the reasons that Manchester is unique, um, that it, we, we are a city of migrants, uh, that we have this kind of fundamental sense of uh, welcoming migrants here. Um, you know, that we, our kind of social outlook uh, is really built uh, into the fabric of of who we are as a as a as a city society uh, which is which is just quite unique you just do not get the same sense of it elsewhere of course london is in the same way an international city and built in the same way people have have been drawn to london uh, over the years but the, the the thing with london is it's so big it's it's it, it, it's very difficult for that integration to to have occurred over the time period whereas manchester is actually small enough so you know you do you, you we do get that in integration 
And of course, people express themselves more than anything through their cultural heritage. You know, if they want to retain some sense of their identity it is through music and it is through the art and it is through the fabrics and the designs and the clothing and the food and all these things mixed together to create, um, you know, a sense of identity, which is both international, but also very, very local and it gives us this kind of strong sense of Mancunian. Um, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because there's no doubt that this city is, um, it is diverse and has a lot of different um, communities. H how well integrated do you think that people are? Or do you think that people are living but living within their separate 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 cultures and and i guess an, an obvious leading question to that was and what role can art and culture play in that social cohesion i i, th I personally speaking i'll pass the mic on sorry in a sec but personally speaking I, I think over my lifetime of being active in manchester's kind of grassroots culture that i have seen i have seen integration occur that you know that they that, that Places, not just like Band on the Wall, but, you know, social spaces um, and cultural spaces have been places whereby people meet, they socialise, they talk, they exchange ideas. Uh, and that, um, uh, and certainly within Manchester and, and the, 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 the richness of our, our cultural offer has, has really helped to uh, sustain that. Uh, but I, I would say, you know, I, you get to an age where you, you you can kind of look back and you think, you know what, it, it really is a bit less ghetto, ghettoized. It's a lot less ghettoized than, than it was, to be honest, back in the 80s. And um, and so you, and then you look further back into history and you think, well, actually, uh, this is, you know, I'm seeing 30 years now of a, of a process that maybe has been occurring over 150 years. Uh, and, and therefore, that gives you some confidence that that uh, the journey that we are on is 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 progressing you know in a positive way and as it, of course there's always setbacks but you know that is that is progressing in a, in a positive way and um, and that you know yeah we can be proud that arts and culture has got a, a really important part to play in in that you know that that all our spaces you know we should uh, celebrate all our spaces do uh, do contribute to that i think it's um, yeah something we should be really proud of do you feel that all our cultural spaces are, uh, are are welcoming for everybody? Do you think that they're, you know, do you think <laughs> for the podcast there's a face? <laughs> there's a <laughs> um, I want to, okay, so yes and no. Okay, so I want to say mostly yes because I feel like people are interested. Keep persevering. Okay, and I'm just gonna hold it. Magic it back to life. Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like Manchester is such a like welcoming com community. Okay, uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to come back this fast. I'm not gonna lie. Um, and everyone's really open to like the people that I have come across are really open to like learn about you, learn about your culture, your religion. And by the way, culture and religion are two separate different things. And I always say this, and we need to be very careful when we're asking questions rather than saying, so in your culture, in the Muslim or Muslim culture, it's not a culture, it is a religion. You just can't say that. Uh, <laughs> you, you really can't. Uh, so no, yeah, people are open. People wanna wanna change stuff and I appreciate that. But my no, the reason why I say no, it's because the industry that I'm in isn't Muslim friendly. So a lot of places would be, um, you know, serving alcohol. Um, and normally I, I can't stay after nine o'clock because it's just not my environment. So right now I know you guys are not getting drunk. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> but normally if I'm going to an event, for example, I get booked at so many events in London and I'm always the first one to leave and they always finish at 12, one o'clock and I'm just like, everyone's like, why are you leaving? First of all, because this is not my environment. Second of all, my parents, <laughs> my parents won't be happy with me staying here. But again, the main reason it's because of my beliefs and and yeah, I just, I don't know. It's, it's a bit of a tricky, I don't think I can really give you a proper answer right now, whether if it's like, if it's a welcoming 
place for people like myself or not. Um, the only thing that I can say is, yes, people are welcoming. They want to learn about you. But, this, but at the same time, it's not a welcoming environment. It's not Muslim friendly. And even when I get, you know, um, offered a job, a, a job opportunity, there is always something that I don't agree with as a Muslim or as a Bushra. And it doesn't align with my morals and values. And when I speak up, it's like cancel culture is there waiting for me. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's like, we talk about freedom of speech all the time, but when people wanna voice their opinions and speak freely, we're just like, you will get canceled if you say one more word. You either accept this job or leave. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's a difficult one to answer. Well, yeah, it is a difficult one to answer and it's, everybody's, uh, everybody's grappling with it. And hopefully, you know, events like this and you know will your your story will hopefully encourage people to ask questions and yeah. be more respectful and learn you know we're just we're just all here to keep learning and yeah. le learning and learning and growing aren't we yeah. but i think you know this this week there's been quite a lot in the press about glastonbury and how glastonbury um hasn't you know lenny henry's come out and sort of talking about um how it how it not diversity is for many reasons and not least for ticket prices um as well as um and you know and the accessibility um of um of, of things um, at the exchange, what what sort of things are uh, is the is the Royal Exchange doing to ensure? Because the the thing about one of the things about the the exchange, which can be and is a barrier to some people, is the most beautiful space. It's one of the things that sells the place, but actually, it's also one of the things that stops people going because they think it's it's not not for them. Can I just answer that question for you very quickly? As someone that has been part of the Royal Exchange, they are very diverse and they are very accessible and welcoming and I've seen that when I, sorry, I'm so sorry, but I really had to answer this question. No, no, on a real level, I I was part of um, uh, the young company at the Royal Exchange. Uh, I was doing performing sessions and they were very, very, very accessible, very open-minded, very welcoming and I would recommend anyone to actually apply um, and do anything with them. This is why I'm just like, I'm so interested in the Royal Exchange. I want to do more <laughs> with you guys because it's such a welcoming environment and uh, I really appreciate it. There you go. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. You said it better than I can because you're the person who's experienced it and uh, that's exactly, that's the best thing we can hear is that, uh, you know, you do feel welcome and it is your home. You said that you love coming to the cafe and just sitting there and you feel completely at home there and that's the best thing we can do because that's what we want people to feel and that's what we're constantly trying to do. But there are Areas and I think just the, the nature of the building, those big steps going up to it. If you don't know it's there, you probably will not feel like you could open those doors to come in. Um, but when you do get in, I think everyone does feel who who have kind of engaged with us that it is that family, it is that safe space, and um, it is diverse. And you you can see yourself represented on the stage and in the stories that we're telling. Um, but there can be a lot of challenges for people to make that first step. Um, and so we are doing a lot of work that, it, um, as as Kate kind of referenced about our work called Local Exchange, that we is, is supported by OCT, um, and um, that's our kind of real place based work that we're doing in specific communities. And one of them is Cheatham Hill, um, and I kind of res reference the Cheatham Hill Cultural Festival. And we've been working there for about four years now. Um, uh, working to understand the community, work with the partners that are there. Um, and we've developed a group of ambassadors who are representative of that community. So going back to that question around, you know, um, uh, do people work together or are people in their own, own uh, kind of uh, community within a community? Um, you know, we haven't found that in Cheetah Mill. Yes, there is like the Ukrainian Cultural Centre or the Irish uh, History Centre. You know, there's, there's a lot of different groups there. Um, but actually, they all do work collaboratively together and learn from each other and, and share their stories and experiences. Um, and we have got an incredible group of local people. Um, some who have never been to Rock Change before we start working there, some who are big advocates, um, artists in, uh, who have been working for, for a long time, some people who've come from like Abraham or school who are, who are new uh, to, to uh, kind of finding their creative voice. Um, and they're programming uh, The Den, which is the pop-up theatre that Kate referenced um, that's going into the uh, Ukrainian centre. And we're just about to publish the, the whole um, programme. But in terms of... Um, you know that that and that that's been co-created with with the ambassadors, so they, they've kind of programmed that festival, and it is an incredible range of 
theatre, uh, but also beyond theatre. So it's got, there's two art exhibitions. There is music, there is dance, there is spoken word, there is um, uh, workshops. Um, and that's that's been the really good thing for the Royal Exchange is it, us learning as well. What do, what do different communities want? What do people want to see? Um, and the long term, that helping to influence um, how we talk, how, what our, how we communicate with people, um, how we welcome people into our space uh, as well. So that's the, that's the big thing we're doing. It's a very long term and we're working in these communities for a very long time. Like I said, we've been there four years in Cheatham Hill. We're not planning to leave it anytime soon either. Um, and it's just been brilliant to develop those really long term relationships um, because it does take time. And practic- just even some of the smaller practical things like tickets. Yeah, so the tickets, so for the den in, in uh, uh, the Ukrainian centre, it's it's one pound tickets for every everything and free workshops. Um, we are, in previous places, we've taken it to Lee and we've taken it to Staley Bridge and that was pay what you decide tickets. Um, uh, and, uh, but yeah, these are just a, a, a one pound ticket, which is again decided with the with the ambassadors um, to encourage people to, to kind of get into a habit of yeah, buying a ticket. Uh, but also we're um, encouraging donations to the Ukrainian centre and um and uh, to support uh, the crisis happening in Ukraine it feels very important uh, where in that space that we're also supporting um the community in which we're uh working um so um uh yeah, and and then we also have ambassadors have free tickets to give out. So for all of our shows at the exchange, the ambassadors are giving tickets to people in their community to to bring them to the exchange. So people are as well as going out, people are coming in um, as well to the building, um, and and that's uh, and we ha- and like I say, we're working not just in Cheatham Hill, but working in Beswick, uh, in Rochdale, Lee, and in Staley Bridge as well. And just quickly talk about the um, the box office and the customer service. Yeah, well, so it's we, not just all about. No, it's the, not the about all the performance. Yeah, so we have. Um, uh, we started it in uh, in when we did the den in, in Staley Bridge. Uh, we work with partners in the area to uh, offer uh, training in front of house and customer service um, roles. So the den is, uh, you know. All of it is run by local people. So when you're coming, you probably see some you might recognize actually welcome you into that space. Um, and uh, so that's a training program that we deliver. Um, and then for those that are interested, uh, hopefully some will be interested to come on to roles at the Royal Exchange. So uh, three uh, women from uh, Thameside went on to join our visitor experience team and two from Lee as well. Um, and we're currently, we're in about week three working uh, in Cheatham Hill uh, and we've got uh, 10, 10 new people who are working with us uh, and, uh, you know, really hopeful, especially because it's a bit more nearer to our venue, uh, that more people will want to kind of gain employment with us. Um, and, you know, everyone we're working with in these schemes are, are currently unemployed. And um, so it's given real, real skills and opportunities Um and Debbie, who is one of our ambassadors in terms of, I think is a brilliant example of she uh, was uh, unemployed. Uh, we met her through uh, Jigsaw Homes, one of our partners, um, and she went on to not only uh, become a part of our fund. Uh, our visitor experience and become an ambassador uh, in Thameside. She has performed on our stage in 24 Hours of Peace that we did. Um, she is um, now uh, performed as part of a, a legacy project that we've done in Thameside. Um, and she's just made a video, of, like a film for Jigsaw Home. She's really found her voice as an actor now and is also flying with that. And that was something that, you know, she she wouldn't uh, um, if she was here now she would be very vocal about it. She, she never thought the theatre was there. She always says I think I had to wear a tiara to come in this place. I would never have come in. Um, and and now she she works it with us regularly. So um, and it's it's that's important about that representation and 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 people and make it a welcoming space that you see yourself there. Uh, whether that's the person who's tearing your ticket or or it's the person on the stage or you know across, across the theatre. And that's what we're we're trying to do. Yeah, no, she's a she's a lovely example. I got accosted on um, on Oxford Road, but yeah, you're that den lady. And she gave me a big hug, and uh, she's brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. Um, Gavin, you've done you've spent a lot of money making your uh, making your space um, b- beautiful and work better, but also it 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 does feel more um, accessible. And yeah, we've we've done a lot over the years to to try and. Um, make it as accessible as possible at all levels. And of course, again, like all these things that, you know, it is a bit of a journey, uh, but we we um, uh, we were the first small venue in the country to, to hold the gold standard for um, 
uh, physical accessibility. And uh, and that was, again, uh, not just about the building and flat access and all those kinds of standard things, but also about staff training and messaging and the website and uh, putting the audio loops in. So, you know, you, you, you've... You, You've really got to throw yourself into, um, well, it's not throwing yourself into, you've got to have that belief that, you know, actually the best way to do it is the right way to do it. And uh, and that's what we've done. And it, it really has informed everything about uh, the way we've developed the new venue. So the aim with the new venue was that not only could anyone get into the venue, in a, certainly in a wheelchair, but uh, could do that uh, unaided. So uh, we've got automated doors all the way through, right the way up into the learning suites. There's accessibility toilets. There is uh, hearing loops everywhere there's low counters uh, everywhere where we need them um, that all the websites being rebuilt around triple a principles for accessibility uh, we do a audio brochure every every month so um, all these things are really ingrained into our processes um, so that's in terms of you know disability access but I, I suppose uh, for people feeling that they can access the space comfortably um, we're very fortunate in that, you know, we have this very long history that goes back with many different communities within Manchester. So, um, you know, we, we do enjoy, a, you know, a very diverse audience and uh, people do come in and, and they do feel comfortable. And of course, our programme represents that diversity and it, it celebrates internationalism and our staff reflect that. And, uh, you know, so it's, it, 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 it's not, I'll be honest, it's not like it's ever been a, a kind of an, an it's always a journey, but it's never been an effort, I would say. It's um, it's something that is just really ingrained into the culture of who and what we are. I've not always worked in those kinds of places. I've got to say, you know, um, I worked for a, a, a very large um, orchestral institution for a while. They were brilliant, uh, but, uh, you know, culturally they, they, they had a lot you know much further to go and we had to drive that process through you know with a, a few of the the management team who were committed to to you know really embedding equality into everything that we did so uh, you know what there's a whole hour of conversation with all sorts of people <laughs> to be but fundamentally what I, I would say is is that thing of um it's a, it's about the culture it's about embedding so it's not nothing not it's not an effort to make an effort for people to be able to access things it should just be what you do and one of the things i love particularly about the space now is is making it open and accessible to people you know interesting you're talking about different different times of day and wanting to, and different vibes of of spaces that you've 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 got this amazing facility there are all sorts of wonderful public spaces that are closed off for lots of periods of time and you you guys have deliberately created an environment and put different things on for different people to use in different ways throughout the day absolutely so there's uh you know there's a secondary performance space so again that's free to access so uh again the aim of that is supporting emerging musicians to to get into the sector and again we want them to get into our culture because there is a music industry culture that is quite hard to penetrate so you know that's about that but at the same time it's free we we don't charge ever so i'm always constantly trying to find ways of financing that but um uh, so that then that is free for people to access who, who can't afford it but then there's all the, the hidden spaces upstairs so uh, we've we've integrated um cameras into uh, all the stages and spaces uh, and upstairs we've got a, a set of studios now those studios are not uh, to create really you know fantastic broadcast quality uh, films for media city or something that they, they they are for uh, I was a big fan of Jamal Edwards, you know, when he first came out and he was doing what he was doing, I just thought it was incredible. Um, so this is, we've created a space that is all about providing opportunities, mainly through the Manchester College is, is our route at the moment, uh, to be able to come in, uh, film the bands, meet the band. It's all connected with the stage. It's, it, uh, the architect's just done the most amazing job, but it's connected with the, with the stage so they can run down, meet the artists, interview them, bring them upstairs. There's an upstairs terrace where they can film them and interview them and record them. Um, so, you know, it's, it, again, it's... Um, 
uh, it's free to access you know I, for me i just i just want to find you know 10 kids a, a year and say look is is a tv studio just is a tv studio here's loads of bands here's some great music just do what you want with it you know so so that's um that's kind of where we're headed at the moment with that because again what we've found the other thing we we run our own sorry i'm going on now aren't i but we we run our own bar you know so uh, and, and box office so we we um we recruit young people you know into the bar very often you know through the manchester college and they'll come and work on the bar and then you, you, what you're looking for is enthusiasm really you're looking for you know enthusiasm and drive and and we've had so many young people come through our bar that have then progressed into the industry and 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 i've got i've got ex you know people who've left school probably with very little gone through the manchester college and, and well i know that one of them currently is on tour in rome uh, or at least my program manager or uh, head of programming, who also came through the Manchester College, um, uh, went to a Pixies gig in Rome on Monday, and 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 she bumped into to the production manager who went to, you know, and and it's I it's I was, I was saying to Bushra before it's like I've got loads of kids, you know, but these kids are <laughs> kind of going out all over the world doing, you know, and they come back and they tell, oh, I'm doing merch for somebody amazing, you know. And and it's uh, and it's just so rewarding to see, you know. And I think that's a big, that's a big part of accessibility. It's just, it's just, you know. I came from a place where you, I mean, you you just had no idea how to get into it at all. You know, you want to be in the music industry, you've no idea how how to to get into it at all. And um, and I was lucky. Same thing, you know. I had a teacher, and then I went to a college, and I had another tutor who was great, and you know, and that was kind of the pathway in, but. But, um, uh, and that's kind of what we want to do. We want to provide those pathways in uh, and the more ways we can do that. Uh, so with these, uh, you know, the new spaces upstairs with the studios and, uh, and but also, you know, accepting that, you know, people need to, people need to earn money. They need, they need a job. And, you know, part of what they're looking for is to, to get employment in the sector. So, um, so yeah, that's a very long, sorry, Kate. No, no, don't, long, no, wasn't don't it? apologize. But, but uh, yeah, that for me, they're all part of the same thing. They're all about accessibility. It's all about providing opportunities for people who, who wouldn't normally get them. And, and, and you want that, you know, for that, sorry, I'm really going on now, don't you? <laughs> we love that. I'll, we love I'll stop now. <laughs> sorry, I, prom you, I, I promised a conversation and, uh, and I was yes. throw, throw it out to you guys. Uh, for if you've, Has anybody got any questions for the, uh, for the panel? Can't hear. Okay, in short, what do you think the biggest difference between culture building communities in Manchester in comparison to London where it's just on a completely different scale? And I'm not asking why it's better or worse, but like what do you think the key differences of the Mancunian way is compared to, not the road, uh, <laughs> compared to London? Um, I don't have an answer for the question. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna waffle away, right? I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't know. You know what? I love London, so I'm just gonna be biased and just say London's amazing. People are amazing there. Do you know what I'm saying? So I I can't really answer the question. I think you you have enough experience yeah. to answer this question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, it's what you reference. It's I mean, it's totally different. It's a uh, it's such a such a huge area, and I I have worked in London, and you know I've worked um and and each area is very different, and so I think when I was working in Tower Hamlets or in in Hackney you know you you are working within that community just as i guess we are in manchester in some ways you might be working in rochdale and that's different to working in in salford and uh, you know you do find your the area so in some ways there's a lot of similarities uh, but it is just that that breadth of it you're probably not as an organization going to be working you know the the young vic is not covering every ward of um every borough of london because you know that's 33 boroughs um you know so it's just it would be hard for an organization to reach all those areas whereas it's it's difficult in great for greater manchester in particular um but um to, to do that but it's probably more possible to do that i think um as a, as a cultural organization um and The only thing I'd add to that, sorry, is uh, it does um, it does seem to be more focused into those boroughs, doesn't it? So people do, you know, do great work, but within their own communities. Um, 
I just, I guess, I guess my worry is, and I wonder if the panel agree, um, as actually living in Manchester is becoming harder and uh, less accessible, and uh, we talk about Manchester's rich cultural heritage, and a lot of that is working class, and just worry with all this, you know, economic miracle that's going on around us, if Manchester becomes less of that creative city and more of a uh, consuming city regarding culture. What do you think? Interesting question. I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that got me thinking. <laughs> it is interesting. I think um, because I've seen a lot of people leave London and come to Manchester as the as uh, because actually London isn't accessible. If you're an artist, it, you know you can't make a living there. It's the rents too high. You can't have a family. You couldn't settle. You can't. And so people are seeing Manchester as the opportunity. Um, oh, well, I can do that there. And there is so much culture here and there is so much opportunity. So I will come here. And 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 so I think at the moment it's kind of providing that. But whether longer term then that Manchester then follows the same route as happens in London and then people are now finding, oh, I can't, actually, I can't stay in Manchester now. Where's the, where's the next place? Um, so I hope, but hopefully Manchester can can look at what's happened in London and learn from that. And actually, make sure that it, you know, it is still an affordable city to be to to be creative and to have a living here, and make sure it is accessible to people who you know have lived here for a long time, but also new people who want to come in. That's like you say, that's what makes Manchester, you know, the new people coming into the city. But um, yeah, absolutely, I think we've got to look at what's happened in London and make sure that it we don't repeat it here. Um, my question was very much actually in the same vein did, and I was going to kind of pose it as do we think Manchester might become kind of a victim of its own success in a way but I guess more pointed and um, you know I, th I think culture is almost like a weapon that is used in the artillery of developers and it's not no shade against Bruntwood at all um, but it, it is becoming weaponized and is there a danger do you think that you know when people are trying to gentrify areas they've always used culture whether it be art music etc bring those things in to you know forge these communities as we're talking about so I guess it's like is there a danger that, you know, I work with a lot of um, DIY venues and as we see these high rises going up, it almost feels like the shadows are starting to fall on these venues. And I mean, you know, you're talking from two amazing um, spaces there, but the smaller ones that don't have those, that aren't those big cultural institutions, but very much, you know, for me in the nightlife industry are cultural institutions. They're going to get pushed out eventually because Manchester is developing at such a massive rate in favour of, these more kind of, like I say, sanitized, homogenized spaces and communities. So the communities are, that are being forged are actually pushing out the original communities that were there. So it's very much kind of the same question, but I guess just in terms of the rate of development, what do we think that is? Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, well, obviously it's, it's a, a really live issue within the small live music venue sector, isn't it? There's a number of venues that have been forced into closure because uh, developers have built big apartment blocks next to them, very often put someone in the apartment blocks to complain to get it shut. And, you know, we, we probably, if you follow it in the press, you'll know some of those, some of those stories. And, um, of course, it's really important um, that we recognise that those uh, spaces of which you know yeah band on the wall has transformed into something else probably now but uh, you know it started off as you know a pub at the end i mean i remember when the northern quarter was largely derelict no one went through there and band on the wall just sat at the other edge and it had um uh yeah i can't remember the doorman's name but it will come to me uh yeah, yeah, it's about 35 years ago. So, But he would just open the hatch and, and let it come to me. Um, and uh, so, you know, ban on the... But th these these kind of spaces are, are culturally enriching. Of course they are. And spaces and organisations like ours, uh, uh, and I think Inga would agree, have an absolute responsibility to retain our connections with those early developing spaces, to advocate for them, to support them, uh, not undermine them by any means. I mean, we we do 
we take gigs into tiny venues. That's part of what we do. Um, though, you know, we're just a, a small venue ourselves. But I would say that in Manchester, I would say politically, we are fortunate that largely speaking that that is recognized. And even though the developers uh, would love to go in and knock everything down and just keep building and building and building, I think that th for the most part, there is enough protection. And remarkably, even though so much goes up, you just continue to find these spaces that no one else knows is there and someone sets something up. I mean, it just never ceases to amaze me that some archway that I've driven past every, you know, few months for 30 years suddenly turns into this amazing pop-up bar venue or, you know, gallery or, you know, all sorts of things. So, you know, Manchester has got the, you know, it is a, it's like a mega city on all these different levels, isn't it? That the, There just seems to be these spaces. So I, I don't think that we are in danger of, of losing our character yet, but it's very important that the voices are, you know, that we keep shouting out and saying, you know, look, you can't just turn it into another kind of American-esque type city that we really, really want to retain our character. And that's, that's, that's a very, very important part of who we are. But I do think it's recognised politically at the moment anyway. Developers wanting to uh, knock buildings down and just keep growing and growing. I think there are absolutely developers that want to do that, but I'd just caveat that with long term people who are interested in long term investment and development, which which we are and many other. We're very fortunate in Manchester that we do have a number of other um, property businesses who are interested in the long term success of, of cities. And the only way that long there is we can have long term success is if we are bringing everybody. Um, with us, and we have to have culturally rich, diverse cities and places for them to be attractive for people to live and and, and work. Otherwise, you're just building big shiny buildings that will be empty. Um, and so, so there is a commercial gain in it. Um, but if you if you care about the long term, um, then uh, then 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 you do care about much more than than just the bricks and mortar. So. Um, do we have time for one more? We don't have time for. Do we have any burning, burning questions? Because I'd really love to save a little bit of time. If you'd like to do uh, do a little, uh, do a little. Do, uh, it would be very remiss of uh, remiss of me not to uh, not to let me have a little <laughs> uh, little turn. Before we do that, though, just very quick fire. What event, arts and culture event, is coming up that is a for you, in your in your mind is a must must see. What would you uh, What would you be plugging? What are you going to? That uh... can I just plug my open mic? Go <laughs> for it. It's the Sunday. Um, it's literally a five minute walk from here. Tickets are three pound just to literally cover, um, you know, travel expenses, getting a taxi, getting my speak on my mic, a good microphone like this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah and then obviously I've got other events going on but uh, this is the priority right now like my mum would like to say it I know her accent is ridiculous but I love her uh, but there you go that's it for me um, uh, well the den in Cheatham Hill at the Ukrainian Centre is coming up very soon uh, uh, so if you're in that area definitely come along uh, and support some amazing local artists and some also brilliant work uh, that's coming into there uh, but also um, uh, Switch Manchester I always, if you want to see something this week um, they are a company that have come out of the Royal Exchange Young Company um, and um, uh, they've got a double bill on at the moment and uh, they just opened last night. So I think check out Switch Manchester as an exciting new young uh, theatre company in, in the city. Oh my gosh! Is it one of is it our, one of our events? Anything, when anything. All oh right, so uh, we've got Malatu on at the end of August, and if you've never seen him before, he's a total, total legend. You just missed Azimuth on Sunday. Who th these are all guys that've been around. Malatu's probably in his seventies now. Azimuth, they're they're, they're they're all in their seventies now, and 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 uh, just amazing musicians. Um, for new stuff, we've got uh, we've got Sammy Ray coming next year, and I have been. If any does anyone has anyone ever heard of Sammy Ray? Sammy Ray and Friends. She kind of pops up on playlists. Um, 
So anyway, I was telling my guys, they're all younger than me, you know, my guys go, go to books. So we've been trying to get her for about four years now. And uh, we finally got her uh, to come over. And uh, and we're kind of having bets in the office about how quickly it would go. And and, uh, and I said, oh, t we'll, we'll have sold half the tickets by the end of the weekend. They're like, you're joking. Anyway, we sold uh, 250 tickets by the Sunday and it's about to sell out. So, uh, so uh, if you don't know her yet, you probably will know her in a few years time or hopefully 12 months time. So, so I definitely check that out. We'll probably put a second show on sale as well. So yeah, great. Oh, there's so much. That's there is the problem, so, there is so much, and I'm going to cheat so cheat and remind easy. you all about Blue Dot. So yeah, yes. Yeah, so. Go and uh, yeah, don't don't forget uh, Blue Dot Festival in uh, in July. Um, you're ready. Do you want this? Which one? Um, it's the same. It's, yeah. Um, which one is it again? Well, do, do which one you want. I like. What did I like? Hidden, hidden truth. Okay, the hidden truth. Okay. Um, I'll do my first ever spoken word piece that I've, I've done before. By the way, guys, I've been working all day at home. I haven't eaten anything. That's why I'm a bit shaky. So excuse me if I'm like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Um, but um, okay, I'll do the hidden truth and then I'll do my, the first spoken word piece that I've ever written. Um, I've never done it sat down, you know. Now let me try doing it sat down, you know. Okay. I might be asked to do this again. So I'm like, I'm prepared. I've, this is rehearsal, yeah? Um, okay, so here's the truth that nobody's have, no, see, food, I need food in my system. Here's the truth that nobody has ever told you and will never tell you. If you're over 20, healthy, wealthy, with love, support, and peace of mind, and still don't know what to do or where to go, it's okay, it's fine. I know it's a hard life, but you need to start thinking with your mind. Life is too short for delay. Life is too short to procrastinate. Life is too short to think what they're gonna say. You live for you and only for you because nobody's ever gonna be in your shoes, but you need to get in their shoes to win and not lose, to learn from their excuse to be the news. When I say news, I mean good news. News that will make people want to be jewels and give excuses to your overviews, dissent, situation, sensation, aspiration. And that's what I've got to say. Um, okay, so I feel like it's very... For, I always try to do this spoken word piece just because it's kind of like a summary of how I am as a person and um, it's the first poem that I've ever written uh, and it's kind of a good introduction to who I am to people that don't know me. Um, but yeah, it's called Power. Uh, and I wrote it like in less than five minutes. Um, but yeah, it goes like this. This is how, by the way, I discovered that like I can actually write, ah, which is crazy. Oh, also, also, um, I wasn't meant to be on this workshop because you're meant to be from the age of like 16 to 19, and I only just turned 20. Um, so when I was, so when I wrote it, I wrote, I'm 20, strong, independent, fearless. But when I was reading it out on Zoom, I was like, I'm 19. <laughs> I'm 19, strong, independent, fearless. I was like, ah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I really wanted to improve my writing, that's why I kind of lied, which I feel bad. Um, God forgive me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it goes like this. I'm 20, strong, independent, fearless. Never thought about giving up when I'm furious. I always looked at the full half of the glass when I'm serious. Because failure was never an option for me because I'm dangerous. Life is too short for me to be a coward. Praise God for giving me the power. That's brilliant. Thank you ever so much to the panel uh, for coming today and uh, giving up their time and sharing uh, sharing some of your thoughts. And thank you very much for you guys for uh, for coming and joining us. Thank you guys. Amazing.